<laughs> All right, welcome online. Glad you could be with us. Hope you have a good morning. Hope you're having a good morning. Amen. How are we all here? Good? Yeah. Pretty full. That's good. It's hot outside, isn't it? Man, I wants to be a gardener. All right. So, thanks to everyone. That was awesome. Uh, worship was fantastic. It's really good. Amen. Really good. Just bring it on. Just love seeing just Ross on the drums and the girls are just doing it. Jeff's got it rolling there. It's good. Bless you guys. So Christian Araldite is the title of today's message, but I'm not telling you what that means until the end. All right? You should probably, you probably work it out anyway. Let's just start with this. Oh, let's pray. Actually, that might be a good thing to do. <laughs> Father, we just commit this morning to you. Lord, we just thank you for your word. What would we be and do without your word, Lord? And Lord, I just pray that your word is planted deeply into the hearts of your children this morning. Lord, I give you full permission in this pulpit to teach, preach, speak and share however you will. That this, that We are your sheep, Lord. We are your church. And all we do want to do is, is live to please you. Amen. So thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so guys, um, Hayden, can you put that first scripture up? Let's start with this. My contacts aren't real good. I can't see. I'll have to wing this. Okay. What if 85% of Christianity is... Um, more about being a doer of the word than actually performing miracles. So we, we have this perception in church because every page we flick over on the four gospels, we, we see Jesus just doing multiple, multiple, multiple miracles. And I think sometimes we forget that Jesus was on the earth for three years doing that. Amen. So we know he was on the earth for 33 years, but for three years, his, he performed his ministry. And in that ministry, the Bible says that multitudes were healed and that the whole world couldn't contain the books to record the things that Jesus did in his life. It's quite unbelievable, like all things are with God. And so there's a bit of a thing in church where... Um, and I don't want to discount miracles in any way, but there's a little bit of a thing in church and in our walk where you might spend the best part of your walk looking for one of those miracles to get your life right. But what I'm going to suggest to you this morning, that if you do the 85%, God will do the 15%. So the 85% is walking out the Word. Amen? Amen. It's not living from day to day, miracle to miracle. Because we have a, a Father who wants to teach you how to walk through life. He doesn't want to give you a miracle every day to get through life. <laughs> give a man a fish, what will you do? Feed him for a day. Teach him how to fish. He's right for life. So the whole thing about miracles is what, what's supposed to be happening with miracles. The reason why we have all these ministries being raised up and these miracles going on in the earth now is to bless the world. It's to demonstrate the power of the kingdom. But, but for you in your life, like we don't want to live from miracle to miracle every day. We want to, I've had miracles in my life, don't get me wrong. And I've needed miracles, not as many as I would like. But, but and, that, and that's the point. The point is it forced me, because I wasn't getting the miracles I wanted when I think, thought I needed them, it forced me to go deeper into the Word and do the Word. Amen? Come on. This, this is the walk. Like you, you've got an 80-year lease on life. It's not a three-year ministry of multiple miracles. If you want to do that in your life, that's great. Go out and heal everyone. But in your own life, you've got to walk out the Word. You've got to put the Word into practice. 
You can't be sitting at your bedside every morning praying for a miracle to get through the day. Come on. It's just a, it's a long life. We read people's lives in the Bible. We like we read Abraham, and I guarantee you all of you could pick out three major things that Abraham did in his life. But you don't know the other. How, how long did he live? Hundred. How long did Abraham live? Anyway, it was longer than 100 years, I think. <laughs> He's still going good at 99 anyway. Um, <laughs> the point is, what you don't see in the rest of Abraham's life is shoveling the camel poo. You don't see him building tents. You don't see him addressing his family. You don't see him, you know, whatever he's doing, stitching up wineskins or, you know, partying with the Amarmadians or whoever it was he was hanging around with. You only see what was written in his life, the big things. And we go, oh, we all want that. We all just want the Abraham experience. But we forget about all the other things in between. We just, you know, sometimes come to Christianity, we, 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 we just lose our marbles a bit. Yeah, amen. So I believe there's three types of people in the world after doing this message. <laughs> I'm convinced. And you're going to tell me which one you want to be. So there are hearers, okay? Actually, to a lie. Let's go back. There are non-hearers, okay? So there are people who do not hear the Word or do not want to hear the Word, amen? Usually they're the unsaved. <laughs> Could be Christians as well. There are the hearers who hear the Word, Yep. And then they are hearers of the Word and doers. Which one do you want to be? Uh, <laughs> I'll give you the answer. <laughs> Number three. <laughs> you want to be a hearer and a doer. This is the whole point. The other two, there's no, there's no power. There's no substance in it. So, let's read this Scripture. But be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he's like a man beholding himself in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes his own way and straight away forgets what manner of man he was. Didn't I put 25 up? Can we get 25 up, Jim? Okay, this is the most important thing. But who, whosoever, whoever, that's whoever, whoever, that's every tribe and nation. This is not speaking to Western countries. This is not speaking to Asian countries. This is not speaking to tribes. This is speaking to mankind. I love the Bible. It's, about, it's for mankind. Whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty, the Word of God, and continues in it, it's not a once-off miracle. It's a life. Continues therein, not being a forgetful hearer, not just a hearer, but a doer, this man is blessed. Continuing in and doing it. We can't just be hearers of the Word. Who knows someone who's sat in church for 50 years and they don't look like they've sat in church for 50 years? None of us. <laughs> someone, some other church. <laughs> You know what I'm saying, don't you? You can hear the word till you till your ears fall off. Right. So let's just think about this. If the word says, right, that who continues in the word and does it, this man is blessed, can we then flip that and say? To the measure of blessing you have in your life is the measure of how much you've actually done the Word. Come on, let's just get real. I, I like being real with myself. I can see areas in my life where I'm blessed and there's other areas where I'm not as blessed as I'd like to be. I just like to be real with me. And it's not that, like this message, you, you if any of you guys know me, this is not a message about law, coming under law and doing another thing in church. OMG, that's, we've got to throw that out of the church. 
We're not little doers. We are little people. We are little, little relationships with God. I don't want you to think I have to be another little Christian soldier doing another thing. It's not about doing another thing. It's about hearing what God says to you and doing what you know to do at that time, continually, right through your life. Amen? So the point is, I guess, you know, um, the more we do the Word, or the more we do what we've heard God say in our life, the more blessings will come into our life. And this is the whole thing. We are blessed so that what? We can be a blessing. So we want to grow. We want to um, mature. We want to deal with those things in our life that hinder us. We want to be more capable of taking on more responsibility. We want to walk into our callings and our destinies. Like I just, you know, I hope to harp on it, but look, when Ross plays the drums, aren't we all edified? So every time you take a step forward in what you're called to do, you bless others. I'm, I'm blessed by that. So, so the whole thing about blessing in your life is so, so that you can be a greater influence in the world in your life. And it comes by doing the Word. Amen? And the other thing is, it makes us responsible for our walk. That This statement makes us responsible for our work, walk. See, because we touched on this in the last, last message. Is God in control or isn't He? <laughs> because the victim mentality is killing the church and killing the world. Well, woe is me. But God says, if you're a continuer of the Word and do it, you won't stay a victim. You'll walk into blessing, whatever that is in your life. Let me tell you, I've had a lot of victim mentality whinges to God. <laughs> Many. It's true that some people get a better start in life than others. Now, how many times have you seen people have a, what we think is a really good start and then blow it? Blow it. Just blow it out the door. Their whole life. Needles in their arms sitting in the gunner somewhere. It's a tragedy. And then we see people who've, start, who, who, who've, who've, been, who've grown up in poverty and dust and they become some of the greatest influences in the world. Is God a respecter of persons? Does God love the person who gave the better start more to the one who didn't have the better start? No, He gives us all, he, he's, he gives us all opportunity. And the whole reason the Gospel is to be preached, the Bible says, blessed is the, is the man's feet who preaches the Gospel. Why? So that people get to hear the Gospel and then they get a chance to do something with their life. That's why God wants to go out through the whole earth. So the guy who's got the bad start can come up and be a great influence in life. And the guy who's got a great start doesn't blow it and keeps going. That's the whole idea. That, that's what God wants. So, but the point about all this is that they still have to do something with what they've got. You've got to do something. Whatever it is, you've got to do it. <laughs> wherever you are in life, wherever you come into the body of Christ, whether you're 80 or whether you're eight, you still have to take the Word for where you are and where you've come from and apply it to your life, don't you? Amen. Some have to apply it more than others. It's just the way it is. But like Marie said, God is always good. God is always good. And I've said, shared this before that, you know, the things that I went through are things that now bless my life. So even the trials, even the lemons, He turns into lemonades. Come on. Okay, let's go to Joshua 1.8. Just going to ram this home for a little bit. <laughs> How you all doing? All good? Not, no stones getting lifted up yet? Joshua 1.8. This book of the law, we know that can be, just be the Word of God. Shall not depart out of your mouth. So that might mean confessing it. But you'll meditate on it therein, what? Day and night 
okay, day and night. Not just day and not just night. Day and night. Like it's a it's a it's an all-day thing. It's like that you must observe to what? So it even gives you the second part of it. See, it's no good just reading the word of God all day and all night. You gotta do something <laughs> that you may observe to do it. <laughs> but then what? Then the promise comes. So then you'll make your way prosperous. Then you'll have good success. So the same we can say the same thing about this scripture. How prosperous you are and how much success, godly success we're talking about, is in accordance with what you've done with that scripture. You can't run away from the Word of God. You can't, you can't shadow box the Word of God because it'll just beat you every time. We have to be real with ourselves. And if, if you're okay today, if you're sitting here today and you're okay with your life and with your walk in God, great. God's not condemning you. I'm not, this message is not to condemn. This is to encourage you that there's more if you want it. And that there is an answer if you want an answer. There's always an answer. You just haven't found it yet. That's all it is. Just keep going. Just keep continuing therein. That's the point. Continue therein. And continue to do what you know to do. That's what we've done at ARC. That's what our, the, our leadership have done. Like that's all we've known to do. So, and so many times I'll have a three hour whinge to Mandy over the years and she'll go, oh, all I know to do, this is all I know to do. What I've done. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, haven't you got anything better than that? <laughs> Some profound revelation. I just know what to do. Just keep walking. Yeah. Boring. Boring. <laughs> oh. All right, thanks. I'll ring the next person. <laughs> See what he's got. Because, oh, you know, because we, cause we've all seen these people in church, you know, they've been in church 40 years. Oh, I've never seen that happen, mate. Oh, that's never happened for me. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, mate, either you are, in, you, are, you are missing it or God is. You understand what I'm saying? Either God's wrong or you're wrong. Like I, I just, I and I like I like to believe the word of God. I mean, I put my life on it. I put my life on it, and you know, I've said this before. Even if I died and there was no God and no heaven, I'd be happy with my life. <laughs> Listen to some guys on a podcast the other day. It was quite. Sad, really. It was actually really sad. Obviously, they're not believers and they're talking about what, what happens when you die and they're talking about just lying in a box or just going to nowhereness. I'm like, how does that even work? <laughs> you're alive in a box. So you're still alive. You're not dead. <laughs> but, you can, but, this is, but this is the unsaved world. This is the, and the, tr the trauma of it and the terror, the terror of not knowing and then being at a funeral with people who have no hope that this is not the end. It's terrible. So sad. So the tradition of man makes the Word of God no effect, the Bible says. So your tradition can make the Word of God no effect. Oh, mum and dad always do it this way. You know, our culture says that we don't do this. Now we have to do this. And you don't do the Word. And so you don't walk into this. We have to recognise what our traditions are in church. Religion, tradition, the way you've always done everything is not necessarily always the way. Amen? It's, it's scary to think, but there are things that it's, it's, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, I've got the way to go, I've got the way to go, I've got the way to go. It's the sword, it's the, you know, it's the power. Yeah, but what are you doing with it? <laughs> like, are you doing it? Are you doing it and are you appropriating it? Because otherwise you're just a hearer and hearers don't get blessed. Amen? Okay, so let's, um, some things that stop you being a doer. Okay, so let's just, so I just mentioned that culture. I love the cultures of the world. I love the diversity of culture. But culture kills the Word of God. And people who are in culture, who become Christians, 
They need to teach that culture the Word of God. Because I, I started at the start of the message. It's whosoever. It's not China, Russia, Papua New Guinea, Australia, New Zealand. New Zealand. Did they win last night? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. Mate, you can't knock the, the All Blacks. Jeez. They win everything all the time. Um, so culture. Culture steals from the Word of God. And it's not that we don't love culture. But, you know, like as the, walk, the longer I walk in God, it's just not my own culture, the old, my own Australian culture. The, the longer I walk in the Kingdom of God. See, we are aliens and strangers on this earth. Everyone wants to, you know, drape themselves in a flag. Well, that's great. But, you know, before you drape yourself in the flag, you're a mankind. You're a human. You're a child of God. You're not an Aussie first, are you? See, we're going to put all this in perspective. Because we get all caught up in the patriotism of what the country's doing. What's God doing? For humans. Come on, I'm not Jesus was a Jew and, and Jesus did Jew things. Amen. But the bottom line is the word of God is for every person on the face of the earth. Doesn't it? So culture stops people from being blessed. Belief systems. I'll just go through this quickly. You believe God is like this. So you throw out half the Bible. You know, you just believe He's always been like this. You've seen it happen in other people's families. You've seen it happen in, other, in church. And so you just believe that's the way God is and He'll always be like that. And so you don't, be, you don't become a doer of the Word. Like, see, if, if what Marie said this morning is true, God is always good and His mercy endures forever. You need to get that in your life. His mercy endures forever. So forever you stuff up, forever His mercy is available. That'll help you out. <laughs> but if you don't believe that, then you don't get blessed because you're not a doer of the Word. Because you haven't received it. You haven't like stood against all the stuff coming against you in your life or your dysfunction or your background or your churchology and take the Word of God and just say, no, no, I've got mercy. No matter what I feel like, or no matter what people say to me, the Word of God says His mercy endures forever. And it doesn't say there's any conditions on it. It doesn't, doesn't say you've done this much sin, so the mercy stops now. It says His mercy endures forever. And there's a whole million other Scriptures about God's mercy. So a belief system will stop you. Pride. It's funny how Jesus always majored on us becoming like little children. He never said, oh, you prideful bunch. He didn't like condemn us, did He? He just said, this is the way. Become like a little child. When you become like a little child, it's very hard to be prideful. You know? And, you, and, you're, and when you're a little child, you're just focused on the King. So you didn't get caught up in all the other distractions. And, and you just become an, enamoured with Him and just where He's going and what He's doing. See, pride will take you away from that. Pride will tell you, you know best, and I'm going this way, and it's my way and not necessarily God's way. And pride comes from all sorts of things in life. Pride is not just because you're prideful. Pride comes from all those things I've just said, culture, belief systems, tradition, being hurt, whatever. Selfishness. It's just the nature of Adam. You know, selfishness, like, um, same thing. My way over the kingdom way. You know, we've all, we're all in this situation every week, in, in, in every scenario. Like, you know, what would Jesus do? We see those little bands and they're, and they're cool. They're not everything, but they're something, aren't they? How would, like, when you're in a scenario with a person, you know, there's plenty of times when I'm 
dealing with customers at work and I don't really feel like being like Jesus to them. <laughs> I just want to write them off. <laughs> and I don't really want to do the correct procedure to deal with the, the, the issues or something that's going on in the job. I just want them to get over it and move on. But then I, I have to, so here's the thing. So I have, to be a, I have to choose to be a doer of the Word or not, if I want to be blessed. So the more I choose to be a doer of the Word, the more I'm blessed, the more I choose not to, it's fine. You just get whatever you get. You get, you get the things that come with that. It's not to beat anyone up. It's just to say, that's, that's the way it goes. Other counsel. So, you, you know, other counsel stops you from being a doer of the Word. And, and like, I'm not against other counsel. I'm not against non-Christian counsel either, either. But just make sure it all lines back up with the Word of God. Make sure it all comes back in with the Word of God. Word of God and you'll get that wrong sometimes I got it wrong for years I got rid of my family because I thought I was following the Word of God it's alright God brought it back around you know that's why I can teach a little bit on those things now but I, I basically kicked my whole family out of my life because they weren't doing the Word of God <laughs> funny thing they, they started to prosper and I didn't <laughs> I thought something's not right here I actually needed to become humble. I was really prideful. Actually, really prideful. Really prideful. But my heart was right. I wanted to do the Word of God. I just needed I just needed a few more years of how to appropriate it and things like that. Offence. Offence will stop you doing the Word of God. Offence with the church. Offence with God because He hasn't shown up or done what you think He should have done when He should have done it. Now, or people in church have hurt you. So you stop doing the Word. So you stop going to church. That's, that's a sermon in itself. Oh, I'm so big on that. So big on that. As soon as you disconnect from church and your community, you're on a downward spiral. I'm sorry. But this is one of my anchors for life. You know, I said to Jade recently, I said, you know, if we left art for whatever reason, like a cyclone came and leveled it, there was no more church or something, you know. Apart from being blessed out or God leading me out, right? Just make up some story. You know, the first thing I'd do, I would go wherever I was in that city. I would go, I would pray and ask God to show me to find a church, right? And you might take a couple of churches before where you find where you've got to go. But when you feel like you're settled in a church, the first thing I'd do is go to the guy who runs it, whatever, say, mate, what, what roster can you put me on? Car park, door, cleaning, Whatever it is, I just need to get connected to your vision and serve. Because why? Because the King of Kings was a servant. And that's how you get blessed. Come on. The blessings follow when you obey the Word of God, when you become a doer of the Word. You don't walk into a church and say, I've had this mantle and gift on my life and I've been preaching everywhere else for 30 years and you should use me tomorrow. No, mate, get to the toilets. Sorry, we don't know you from a bar of soap. We don't know your character, your integrity. We don't know who you've come from. Have you got any references from where you've come from? Who were you under before? Who were you submitted to? Who was your authority? Because Jesus had authority because He was under authority. There's no cowboys in the Kingdom of God. I don't care what gift is on your life. You get, you get blessed when you come under the structure of God and you get raised up when you walk in the Word of God. And the Word of God says, stay under authority. Was that in my notes? No. <laughs> there might be a bit of a trigger, that one. Oh, was that good, God? Did you say? <laughs> I'll, I'll say an amen to that. Thanks, Guy. Fear. Fear, fear, fear and offence are the two biggest things that will stop you doing the Word of God, without a doubt. Look, let's look at, let's look at, well, well let, without going into any detail, we know the reason why the children of Israel didn't inherit the promised land was what? Well, because of fear. They didn't walk into their promised land because of fear. Amen? What was the fear? 
fear of the giants in their life. The funny thing about that was God worked them all through the desert and, um, and journeyed them. Sounds good, guy. Bless you, mate. Good stuff. Spend that well. Um, so a lot of the times you won't even know what your giants are until you've actually taken a journey of doing the Word. Amen? God will lead you to your giant. Because <laughs> sometimes we all go, oh, I just want to get my life fixed. I want to know what it is that's you know, causing all these problems. But God just wants you to do the little things first. And then when you're ready to go up against your giant, He brings you to that place. Amen? But you have to do the Word of God first. Amen? It's a couple of little... Oh. Fear, just a couple of quick ones on fear. There was a time in my life when I used to just, I would come home from church and if I didn't feel like I got what I needed to get from church, I would come home and open the Bible or put on a Joyce Meyer tape or a video. It's 20 years ago. Right? And just start listening to another message. And because of fear, fear in my life, like I was just looking for peace. And there were many times when I would be at home and the Spirit of God would say to me, turn that tape off and put your Bible down and go for a walk. And then I had a choice. I had a choice to be a doer and be obedient or not. And I had to stand against the fear. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? How would God tell you to put the Word of God down? And then I get in a lot of trouble with my wife <laughs> because a lot of things come up in our life and I don't, I, I try to appropriate not worrying about it. Because Jesus said, what can you change in your life by worrying about it? Like He didn't say, don't appropriate it with the Word of God. But he did say, don't worry about it. So if he said, don't worry about it, I'm not worrying. And it looks like I'm being irresponsible. And it's frustrating, I get it. But I'm at peace. And my health is intact. And my mind is still, so I can hear from God. Because when your mind's not still, you're not hearing from God. Unless he comes up in front of you. <laughs> He's done that too, to me. He's had to do that too, with my mind. But that's not the way God works. That was a miracle. They were, they were miracles. When my mind's racing a thousand miles an hour and it just stops and instant peace comes, that's a miracle. God doesn't want me living like that all the time. He wants me to appropriate the Word of God, do what He says, and then He can, he can work in my life. Amen. So don't worry. It's frustrating. You know, Jesus frustrated a lot of people because He didn't do and go where people wanted Him to go. He wasn't pulled by, he wasn't pulled by the culture. He wasn't pulled by the system. He wasn't pulled by what men were telling him to do. In fact, he told Peter to get behind me and called him a name. <laughs> I was at a conference once, two things. I was at a conference once and we'd been, it was actually me, Pastor Massey, Jim and Pete. Pastor Pete. And we'd been there for three days. It was Bill Johnson and Danny Silk and they were in Brisbane. We'd been there for three days. And as usual, I was really seeking the direction of God in my life. I really wanted to know what God had for me. This is after being a Christian for 12 years. <laughs> and uh, just pushing God, pushing God, pushing God. You know, come to this conference, really want to hear from God. Who's been there? Who's been there? Who's gone to a conference and said, if I don't get a word, or if God doesn't tell me something, I'm going to die. <laughs> I'm not going to make it through tomorrow, you know. And so I was enjoying the conference. And then we came up to the last day. I was like, I haven't heard from God. I mean, I've had all these great speakers, but I haven't heard from God. You know, I haven't got it in here. And, you know, we're, we're three quarters of the way through the last day. And I hear the Lord say, line upon line, precept upon precept. 
and stillness just come into my soul. And I hated that word. I loved that word <laughs> because it was God, right? But I hated it because I wanted, I wanted to hear something else. But then I've got a choice. I can walk out of that conference and go home and put my tapes and read my books again, or I can just be settled with it. Okay, God's just building my life line upon line, precept upon precept. What does that look like? It looks like going and walking the dog. It looks like going and have a coffee with someone. It looks like maybe tomorrow morning I might get up and read the Word. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean go into a 40-day fast. It's just saying line upon line, precept upon precept, Tony. You're trying to run, you know, 20 years in front of me. Just chill where you are, mate. I've got your life in the palm of my hands. Then there was another time I was at a conference and I heard him say to me something about my son. And I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't go home and do it. And so that has ramifications as well. See, because if I'm a doer, there's blessing coming out of it. If I don't do it, then it's not necessarily the world's going to end. It's just that I'm saying being a doer is not just reading the Word of God and saying, love your enemies. It's not just that. <laughs> that's not it. That's only a, well, that's a big thing, but it's, but you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not trying to give you a list of rules and laws to do today. I'm talking about you walking out life with God. Amen. I just, this is what I've seen. I, and I see with the Word of God, people just give up or let go too soon. It's just the truth. They just give up or let go too soon. Amen. That's why the Bible says continue therein. You've got to continue. You've got to continue in the Word. Amen. So I'm a big believer of, of I've said this before, I'm a big believer of taking your prophetic words. This is why I don't understand. When you get a prophetic word, laminate that word and put it on your fridge or put it somewhere in your house where it's like the Bible, where it's protected, where it's gold. It's the, it's the Spirit of God speaking to you about your life from the scroll of your life. If you know it's a, a, a prophet with the runs on the board and you know that they come under authority and you know that they've got a seasoned word and you know that it witnesses to you. You need to keep that for your life and you need to fight, like Timothy said, wage a good warfare with the prophetic word in your life. This is called doing the word. You know, when I was waking up in fetal positions every morning and in fear, I'd pull out one of those prophetic words and go, and God would say, no, you're a man of God. You're going to teach the Word of God. You're, going to say, no, 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 no. you're not going to be in fear. You're going to influence others. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And I'm like, that's not where I am now. That's nowhere near where I am now. But I'd get that flipping thing out. My hand would be shaking and I'd say, the Word of God says this. This is what it says. I'm going to be this and I am doing this and I am this now and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like speaking to the fig tree. I'm calling those things which be not as though they are. <laughs> and then you, you put that one down and you pick up another one the next day or in a month's time, another one the next day. But these are like compasses for your life. This is called doing the Word. Because what do you think that, you think if you get a prophetic Word to make any influence in the world, what, that there's not going to be an enemy that comes against you? It's just nuts. You think he's just going to let you walk into his camp and do all the damage that you want to do and walk out again? Come on, guys. We, we know this. We know this in the natural. Does that ever happen in war? Never. So you think it's going to happen spiritually? This is why I always say, you know, the young people get, Jack Frost used to say, Jack Frost got this amazing word. And... Uh, and it required him going through 20 years of hell to actually see the word come to pass. It said that, you know, you know you're know, you gonna have a revelation of the love of God and the Father's love, and you're gonna go all around the world and give this love away, and it's gonna transform nations, and you're gonna minister to people and da, da, da. And he was like a young, he just got saved. He was all excited. He was in Bible college, and, you know, married. And like at the end of that 20 years, his marriage was nearly gone. Everyone in ministry hated him. He didn't have any relationship with his kids, right? 
And then bang, He got a miracle, right? But, and then, then He can, t- because of what happened in those 20 years, now He's got something to take to the struggling marriage. Now He's got something to take to the parents who, who've got a child who's out of control. Now He's got something to give to ministers and pastors who are burnt out and dead. You see what I mean? This is what I mean. Like people go, oh, I've got this amazing word. It's going to be fantastic. God's going to be in my life forever. It's like, no, mate, you're going into hell. <laughs> it's like, Joseph, I've got this dream and I'm going to do this and do that. And then, hello, this is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. And, we're, and, and in church, we don't understand it. Oh, so and so's going through a bad patch. Oh my God, he's off the rails. Oh, yeah, no, he's just on his path. He's just on his journey. Oh, mate, Tony's in fetal position. He's off the See, see, see Tony, today, couldn't get two words out of him straight. He's learning to. No, 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 he's, he's right on course. <laughs> he's right on path. <laughs> he's right on track. We all think that we've just got to be blessing. Like, we, we all think that we've got to be these amazing powerhouses of people who are just going around and touching the grocery store and, you know, touching people here and, and moving the world here and performing miracles in there. And if we're not doing that, we all get condemned. not like that so just a natural, little natural example and then I've done this my whole life Tuesday night go to bed I've got a pain in my elbow from work and it's crazy never really had this before but it would throb every two minutes and then stop for two minutes and then start for two minutes and stop for two minutes and when I was awake I was okay I was dealing with it but when I went to bed I try, like you know you just go to drop off and then that pain would come and wake me up again so I put up with this for about an hour and a half and I'm like, I want to sleep. <laughs> so it's like, okay, I might try the Word of God. You know, <laughs> I just thought I could sleep it off. So I start doing what I know to do. I start speaking over this area of my arm. I start commanding it to leave. I start putting the blood of Jesus over it. I start binding anything that might be a spiritual attachment to it. Right? Yeah, 15 minutes, it's pretty good. It's a good job, all my best prayers. Uh, uh, another hour, <laughs> I'm like, okay, the Word of God didn't work. Right, so now I'm awake for three hours. Guess I've got a choice. What am I gonna do? I can get up and go and have some Panadol. I can wake Jade up, say, sort me out, <laughs> right? Actually, Jade wasn't in bed, she was sleeping with Esther Ruth. So it was good, because I would have woken her up. But I've got a choice. I can either choose again to do the Word that I know, or I can go and have a Panadol, or I can stay awake and it'll be terrible the next day. So, so now I go, okay, so I'm gonna do this again because I've learned to do this, not to give up, to continue therein in the Word. I told you this before, I've been out on a run 10, 12 Ks away from home and had a knee or an ankle that I can't put any weight on. I can't put any weight on it, let alone run home. And then I've spoken the Word of God over my foot or my knee. And then I have to start doing the Word. I have to believe that I'm healed. So I have to start running on a leg that I can't put weight on. And then as I run, just like the guys who got healed by Jesus, as they went to the priests, see, Jesus said, you're healed. Go and do what you need to do ceremonially. And I, but only one of them come back. So maybe the other 10 didn't go and do what He said to do. So you have to believe you're healed. So I start running. One kilometre, eh, still hurting. Two kilometres, getting better. Three, I think I might be able to make it home. Four, I'm fine. Five, I'm home. I don't even stretch when I get home. What was all that about? Don't know, don't care, I'm healed. (laughs) Right? So I've got this elbow, right? Mate, don't worry about it. (laughs) So so, So I go back into this elbow and I start saying, I say all the prayers I know to pray. I even went into the courts of heaven. I've repented all my sins, <laughs> confessed everything. Oh, I'm just covering all bases, mate. <laughs> right? Yeah? But then I just went to bed. I, I just went what I know to do. I just kept saying the Word of God. I just kept saying, Lord, You said, You said, 1 Peter 2.24, You said that by Your stripes, I am here. You said it. You said that by Your stripes, Sleep, no pain, 
no pain. I had that pain for four hours, on and off for two minutes. I prayed over it. I couldn't get rid of it. That just just doesn't happen. That's not a coincidence. That's the Word of God. Continuing in the Word of God. I wake up the next day and say, I'm going to use that in my message. Amen. I'm just going to quickly go through some things because it's getting long. And I know you're bored. So. <laughs> Kenneth Hagen with tongues. Kenneth Hagen really wanted to press into tongues. And so he was pastoring a church and he said, I'm going to pray in tongues today until something happens. And one, after one hour of praying in tongues, he said, the devil came to him and said, you're just wasting your time. Look what you could have done in one hour. There's all this administration you could have done, these people you could have visited, there's things you need to do, blah, 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 blah. And so Kenneth Hagin said, the next time you come and say, me that, say that to me, I'm going to pray in tongues for another hour. So two hours went, same thing. Gets to the two hour mark. Oh my gosh, now it's two hours. <laughs> Look what you could have done in two hours. Long story short, that basically happened for four and a half hours. Four hours and 45 minutes into praying in tongues and refusing to believe the enemy and believe what God said about tongues, he went into a spiritual experience that he said to this day is one of the greatest he's ever had. God took him to the throne room. God took him here. He was visions and his ministry changed. How much do you want to do it? It's, it's up to us whether we want to do it. It comes back to us. I know, I, I hate that. <laughs> I just want God to do it all. <laughs> it's frustrating. It takes great courage and great humility to do the Word of God. People don't really like this analogy, but it, killed, it got Jesus killed. Doing the Word of God got Jesus killed. Did. Obedience to the Father got Him killed. There's a lot in that. I'm not going to go into that today. It's very hard to, to forgive and love after you've been wounded. You know, I, I would imagine that a marriage breakdown, divorce, would be one of the hardest things in the world to, to come back from because of the closeness and the intimacy you build with that person. And then they become the person who wound you and hurt you. It's very hard. You need God to be a doer. But to, but to be blessed, you need, you need to do what God says. It's not instant. Like you don't just forgive, like, oh, just forgive them and move on. No, you, you need to let God take you through that process. It might be two years, five years, ten years. Whatever it is. But... But there is a way out and there is healing. And remember, God takes all things and makes them work for your good to those who love God. If you love God, if God is always your priority and, you, and your desire is always to please Him first, He will always take everything and make it work for your good. Amen? I've shared, that, I've shared those experiences in my own walk with forgiveness. Here's one for Hayden. I don't know if you know this, Hayden. You know that Chris Vallotton held midweek meetings, I think for 15 years. And for 15 years, he was in the toilet before the midweek meeting, vomiting from nervousness and fear. Every week. <laughs> People were knocking on his door and he was in the toilet. But he's doing what God's called him to do. And, and that little snippet I gave you with my word of God thing about the prophecies, Chris has got some amazing testimonies of that as well. That exactly the same thing. He was in, in uh, fear, and depression, and whatever, and he would take out the words that have been spoken over him and he would confess them out. He would, he would wage a good warfare with the word of God. Amen? Do the word. It takes great humility. God's kingdom way over your way. Amen? I reckon we do that really well here at ARC. I reckon we, we choose that. We know it, but we choose it as well. Like we, 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 we might struggle with it in different ways, but eventually we come back around and go, is this the kingdom way? 
Is this the kingdom? Are we doing what the kingdom wants us to do? Above being offended, you know, above our differences. It always comes back to that. You know, this, this, is, this should be the mindset of the church. This, I mean, for me, it's a bit frustrating. For me, it's just not rocket science. I just, you know, whenever, I, like I said, when I'm dealing with customers or situations or circumstances in my life, once I get through my pity party and my whinge and my offended with everyone, somewhere along the line, I come back to, is this the kingdom? Is this my walk with God? Is this, is this what God's calling me to do? Am I doing the Word in this area? <clears throat> okay, ready? We're going to finish. Oh. So I, I want to finish with this because I don't want, I don't want you to leave here with like a, a, a sense of rules and regulations, you know. Like I've just got to, you know, Every time you read a page in the Bible, oh, I've got to do that, 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 I've got to do that. No, 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 no. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. And that's not what God is saying. I mean, we don't want to go back under law. We don't want to come under law of the Word of God. You want to go out this afternoon and enjoy your Sunday afternoon, whatever you're doing. You know, walking your dog, fellowshipping. I'll be at the um, young adults party. Um, so funny. I'll be slamming the doors, guys. <laughs> that old fellow's coming. No, I won't. But, but that's the thing. You, you know, God wants us to enjoy our life and do the Word of God. But it should not be hard. It should just be, it should just flow until we come into a situation where it's a little bit harder than we go, okay, what do I need to do here? Amen? Yeah? So, so we don't want to be submitted by by law, but by love. See, love will allow you to just do the Word of God naturally. See, Jesus operated in love always. And He did the Word out of a love for His Father. It was more important to him to be obedient to his father than anything else, than, than being offended, than being pulled by culture or by man one way or another. And because he loved him so much, he was a doer of the word. Because Jesus loved the father so much, he was a doer of the word. And that's the same for us. To the measure, and this is not to bring condemnation, to the measure we love God will be to the measure we do the Word of God because because He will become the priority. And I, I sort of touched on a little bit, you know, this morning about being, you know, like a child, you're enamoured by Jesus. Let's just look at a, a, a general analogy because I because something Rick has shared like six months ago has just set something off for me, which I really believe. So let's look at it in a relationship situation. So, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery, right? So you can go one or two ways with it. You can spend all your time worrying about not committing adultery, right? You can be under the law. Or you can just be enamoured with your wife. So enamoured with her that there is no drawing away to be drawn away by adultery. It's the same thing with Jesus. You can spend your whole time worrying about whether you're doing the Word rightly or wrongly or just be focused on loving Him. And because of your love for Him, your walk will just flow naturally. You're actually not worried about missing it. Do you understand that? See, there's a statement that came out of Bethel and I really agree with it, you know, again, about the relationship thing. You know, when you get married, you can say one of two things. You can say, um, you can say, oh, you know, I said yes to you. You know, I said yes to you, right? Or you can say at the same time, and I think it brings good balance. It brings It's quite a strong statement. It said, I said no to three and a half other million people. That's a strong statement, isn't it? When I said yes to Jade to marry her, to be my wife, at the same time, hopefully, I was saying no 
to three and a half other million choices. That's pretty good, isn't it? But you know what? I don't really want to focus on that. I don't want to focus on the three and a half million. There are a lot of choices out there. You know what I want to focus on? Jade. And just being in love with Jade. Because if I'm in love with Jade, and, and her and I are just enamoured with each other, then the three and a half million just fall away. Come on, you've all been in love, haven't you? That's the way it's supposed to work. It's supposed to work like that. It might not always work like that. That's just life. But that's the way it's supposed to work. We're not supposed to be worrying about the three and a half other million. That's why you work on your marriage. That's why you try and work out what's going on here so the grass isn't greener over here. You know what I mean? It doesn't always work out like that, but that's, that's just the way I just really feel like that's, that should be our whole focus in Christianity. Just being enamoured with Him. See, just, Jesus said this to me when I was under law and when I was struggling with law. Who's heard of that Scripture that says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So every time I didn't keep His commandments, I thought I mustn't love Jesus. Who's heard that? Come on, you've all heard that, haven't you? Who's felt that condemnation? You said no, Jeff. I can see that halo over your head, Jeff. <laughs> oh, because um, yeah. So that used to, I used to hate that scripture. Because who can keep the word of God? Come on. Can you keep all of the word of God? Because if you can't, you don't love him, mate. That's just the bottom line. That's what that Scripture's saying, you think. But then the Holy Spirit fell on that Scripture for me. And He said, Tony, if you fall in love with me, you will keep the commandments. See, so this is why you need the Holy Spirit on the Word of God. Otherwise, you'll be really religious and really legalistic. Jesus just said to me, that's not what it's saying. Well, the Holy Spirit said, He didn't say, if you keep my commandments, unless you keep my commandments, you don't love me. Or keep my, you know, what does it say? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is, every spouse has said that to others. If you love me, you wouldn't do that. If you love me, you wouldn't treat me like that. If you love me. <laughs> right? So we can see Jesus going, if you love me, you'd come to the cross with me. You know, but you're not. So you can get lost, all you 12. <laughs> Where were you in my deepest hour of need? You didn't love me. You didn't follow me all the way to the cross. But what he's trying to say is, if you fall in love with me, if you allow yourself to be enamoured by me, if you uh, build a deep relationship with me, you will always keep my commandments. Come on, because you'll always want to do what he's doing. And you'll always want to go where he's going. Amen? That's how you become a doer of the Word. You don't get another list of rules and regulations. We're not giving you that at ARC. It's always about relationship. Amen? That's how you be a doer. Now, let me finish. So what's the meaning of Christian Heraldite? What does that mean? Whatever. That... No! <laughs> it's a two-part glue. Amen? You got the one part. And the other part, do they work separate? Do you get blessed? Does it? I don't know, do you get the job done with two glues apart? It's only when they come together. Amen. That's the whole thing about Christian Araldite. I don't want to see you guys standing at your workshop, going, "Why isn't this flipping thing sticking together?" You know what I mean? In your life, why isn't this working? It's it's not working because you haven't put two of them together. We must be hearers and doers, amen? And the way you do it is by falling in love with Jesus. Amen? Bless you guys.